Yeah, fine. Okay, so welcome everybody to this always meeting. Um, first talk is going to be about serverless, as I said already. I'm Neil Stanis, and I work for Veracode. Just to get this out of the way, first slide, I'm going to introduce myself, a couple of people I know. So I work as a security researcher, which um, I'm mostly focused on our static analysis work that we do on, on .NET languages. Uh, I got a background in development, .NET systems, I've done it for 12 years. Starting out with the first badass, and after that I moved to the security space, pen testing, security consultancy, and everything that's tied to it. And right now I'm combining all that work into one pretty awesome role in when I'm just like fiddling around with APIs, figuring out like, hey, what are the type of mistakes that people are making, and how can we help out the customers, our customers with giving them advice. We've got open positions. If you want to talk about that, come to me after this talk. So, serverless. I wanted to start it out with a nice cartoon about uh, a, a nice starting point to talk out and, and, and start a conversation. Um, I ran into this one. I found this really funny. So, serverless economic impact. Uh, what we see over here is probably some some side of the building where two servers are standing outside in a box, probably like homeless or out of work, smoking a cigarettes. And in the back, we see that functions as a service is evil, right? So if you hear the term serverless, which is definitely like a buzzword, you probably assume that there uh, is something done or there's, uh, let's say, an IT that, that uh, IT service that doesn't involve any uh, service, like physical service itself. And I think you're all, all aware of it that it's definitely not the case and there's still machines that do the work, right? But, um, and with that, there's a lot of stuff, like if you're doing serverless, there's a lot of benefits, and there's also a lot of people talking about what those benefits are from a security perspective. And I think it's important to um, to have a good overview of what the consequences are if you're developing these kinds of architectures. So to get that, we're first going to do some definitions, and I'm going to give you an overview of what service is, and what functions as a service are, or at least like how I will be talking about this during this talk, because... I think this is almost a similar analogy talking about cyber or about cloud, right? There's a lot, and uh, I just want to lock it down to make sure that you all have the same definitions. Then we're going to talk about some of the benefits you will have from doing serverless implementations on service, on, uh, on, on software systems. And then, of course, the biggest portion of the talk will be about the downside and about security consequences tied to that. At the end, there will be some conclusion and Q&A. If you've got a question during the talk, please raise your hand and we will do it right away if I can answer it. So, um, talking about software development and talking about how it evolved over the time. So, when I started out doing my development, I was mostly focused on developing monolith systems, right? So, that's like self-contained applications that contain all the logic, right? So, there's a component that's part that's inside it does the authentication. As you can see over here, it's probably some kind of a web shop example. You see that there's a card, you can do payments, but it's all inside one big monolith, right? So um, what would happen if you need to, let's say, scale out because you have a web shop and something that's really popular and people want to buy stuff. You need to scale and you need to make sure that those, that site is still available. So in, in case of the monolith, you need to duplicate the monolith and deploy it a couple of times and have some load balancer in front of it in order to take care of it, right? So it's pretty self-contained. Everything is inside. At some point in time, there were like layered applications, like business layers, data layers inside of it, and they even tried to do stuff with, let's say, uh, web services, so XML, which was pretty chunky and pretty slow. Didn't work out. So over time, uh, we then moved towards more like service-oriented architectures, which you see in the middle which is nowadays called microservices, or let's say the containers that everybody is talking about and everybody's using. So what happens in that kind of a system is that the monolith has been separated into smaller components, right? As you see over here, we've got one piece that's responsible for the authentication. There's one piece that does the payment stuff and so on, right? So it's clearly separated. Nice benefit of doing microservices is, of course, like you can maybe inside the development team say like, yeah, you're developing that service and you can release it out of bed because it's one component. It's one, it's one piece that's part of a whole system. <clears throat> Same counts for, let's say, scale out. If for some reason 
the authentication microservice has got heavy load because everybody uses your web shop. You can scale out that one and make sure that it's highly available, right? With all the goodness of, let's say, Kubernetes of, of containers of all those things. And we're going to talk about that, but there's a lot possible. So more scalable, smaller components, right? So smaller logical pieces. The next logical step would be functions as a service, which you see at the right hand side. I think the slide is maybe a bit skewed, but, um, in those dots, you see different like icons and the same as the microservices in the middle. But what you would do with functions as a service, so it's not related to, let's say, functional programming or something else. No, it's chopping up those microservices into smaller pieces of computation. So let's say an authentication call can be done, and it can be done in a couple of milliseconds by just checking the back end, checking someone's credentials and give a token back or something like that. That's a, that's, that's a, that's a, a function as a service, right? So that's the small scale and that allows much better, let's say, um, a scalability because you can easily pop up a bit more if, if it's needed. And there's a lot of, um, yeah, um, benefit of, of doing those types of things. So these are three concepts. I'm going to probably touch those a couple of times during my talk, but at least you have some sense of what this is and what function as a service is compared to, let's say, doing microservices or the old-fashioned big monolith. So if we then talk about serverless, and what's serverless, right? So I think the best definition would be it's an abstraction of the service that, that some servers use on, on the internet, right? So in case of deploying a machine, installing everything on it, it's usually a platform which you push something towards, right? So. The nice benefit, it's, it's, it's such a thing that can be scalable easily. And it's also event driven. And that's something we will see later on because that's the whole purpose of functions as a service. It's like events that are being fired, compute is being executed at some point and it will have output. So functions uh, need to be stateless and need to be inferral, meaning that they will really be, let's say, short lived. That's one of the rules. And they need to have a single responsibility, a single purpose of doing one action, right? So login will be a function. Maybe creating an account will be a single function. That's how you need to chop it up. As I already said, it's scalable and it's event driven. Um, one big benefit for the business is that most of the cloud vendors will have a pay per use um, policy for doing that, right? So. If a computer fires, if it takes 10 milliseconds, you only pay those 10 milliseconds. So the business is probably really happy with that because it's easy, it's transparent for them to see um, and how it's used. And the last part, I think that really touches the subject in a, in a, in a great way. That's uh, uh, Eric Peterson. He's from Cloud Zero. He did a talk at QCon last year. And he says, like, if cloud is an operating system, then serverless is its native code, meaning that doing serverless is uh, the best fit for using a cloud platform. I think that's, that's, uh, that's the, 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 the thing that he wants to say with this. So serverless, now we're going to get to functions as a service. And the first thing you always hear is like, keep in mind that functions as a service is not serverless. It's one of the key building blocks, which you will see later when I uh, show you a diagram after this one. As I already said, uh, these services are stateless and feral, short-lived, and need to retain no state. They also need to be idempotent, meaning that if you compute something, the outcome of the second call to that service with the same input needs to be exactly the same. Otherwise, you will have, have issues. And it's scalable and it's event-driven. So if we now take an example of this type of architecture, hopefully you are able to see it in a good way. This is... Um, an example uh, application from Microsoft, um, which uses Azure, Azure Functions, which is their implementation of doing it. And it's some kind of waste management system. It's related to containers. There are sensors inside that container. And based on it, they can see if it's full or not, and they can take actions on it. And that's exactly what you see over here. So first of all, as I said, the, the, the things are event driven. So at the left hand side, you see a series of functions that are responsible for taking data. And in this case, uh, the Azure IoT Hub is a um, connection within the Azure cloud that will provide you data that comes from IoT devices. So the sensor data that's, that's being registered and the things network is probably exactly the similar, similar thing, right? But it's external data that ends up at the function. 
Then the next part is the queue, and that's also one of the building blocks of storage. Right? Because this, a function can have no state. S the data needs to be stored somewhere and needs to be uh, yeah, persisted. And what we see over there is that like the two uh, functions will store the data inside the telemetry queue, and then there's a second function that sees that there are data and it's event-driven. So it will fetch that message from the queue, it will do its thing later on, and log it, right? So there's more stuff that you can do um, besides this. So there's different types of storages, right? But this at least gives you an idea like, hey, this is a, a um, serverless architecture. It's event-driven, it's stateless. And this is being deployed to um, to the cloud, to, to the vendors. So if we then take this and if we see serverless and functions as a service, what will be the benefits from a security perspective? There are no service to maintain. That's always the first thing you hear, right? And um, to, a, to a level, that's completely true, right? Because both Azure and AWS and all the others will have security teams that to uh, investigate all the stuff that's happening and they will patch everything for you. And keep in mind, like functions are running on top of a platform that's done by servers. Um, patches might be done at the same time you're using it, right? It's, in, it's intermediate, it's done at the same, same moment. So infrastructure and servers, those are pretty good covered, but there's still, of course, a lot else and a lot other spaces that have problems. There are no servers to be compromised. That's, of course, also not completely true. Um, picture the, the, the function that computes for a short time, right? If somebody has the ability to hack that function, there's a vulnerability inside of it, and he can maybe do some remote code execution. He might get persistence on that single instance, but most of the cloud vendors have a time limit in which a function can live, and that's usually five minutes or even two and a half minutes, depending on what you're doing. Um, so it will be a short window of persistence, but there's a pretty nice talk done at, I think it's CCC two years ago by a guy called Rich Jones. And he says, gone in 60 milliseconds, where he exactly shows how you can still get persistence and actual data, actual trade data, just pull data out of the system based on AWS. It's a, it's a pretty good, it's a pretty good talk to see that, right? So. Yes, there might not be servers that are like directly compromised, but there's a lot more. And if we have the example of the system we saw earlier, let's say one spot is compromised, then the attacker will try to pivot to one of the other things and maybe use a queue and get on the other parts of the system, right? And the last thing you always hear is like, hey, denial of service is mitigated, right? So if there is a denial of service done on the infrastructure and there's a lot of data being pushed to the cloud uh, vendor itself, most of the time, they got pretty good, um, pretty good things or like pretty good ways on dealing with heavy loads of data, right? But is denial of service really mitigated? I think that's, that's, that's one of the downsides. So I think on infrastructure and network level, it is. But keep in mind that if somebody is able to call a function, which is an API endpoint, and it will push data to that endpoint, and it will do it in a heavy load, like a lot of calls to that API, then, um, um, yeah, that will be spinning up, right? And that's the whole thing of functions. Yes, we have got scalability. We can get a lot of instances running. We're good. But I think it's important to realize like what's happening underneath. If there's a whole chain of functions that's being executed, um, yeah, that will, of course, still have consequences for the system. Um, if people then propose, like, we need to limit that, yeah, then, of course, you're introducing the problem because then you're going to cut it off at some point when, uh, when there's heavy load. And the conclusion is, yes, there is no denial of service, but there's definitely denial of wallet. As long as you got the uh, um, compute available and you're willing to pay for it, the cloud vendor would say like, yeah, yeah go for it. Um, but that's the downside of this, right? So yes, because you're like using a platform which is abstracted, there's no lower level infrastructure, you can leverage that and you can use that from the cloud vendor, but still there's a risk. And if there's a, um, let's say the architecture is not done right or there's still some issues with that, the downstream problems might be pretty big. So moving on to the attack surface of an app, right? So if we can picture that first picture of the, of the monolith and all those other things, if you're doing a pen test engagement and if you get a monolith as a pen tester, you know exactly that's the target. That's the thing you need to focus on and getting your work done and writing up your report, right? With functions as a service, like the application itself is, is smudged, is shattered across a platform and it will 
be event driven. So something will happen here. And then at, at the end result, something will happen here because the queue has got a message. It will be hard to keep track of it, right? There's a lot of complexity tied to that and um, that makes it hard. And keep in mind that um, maybe the, the first step into the system might be an API gateway that takes care of the first authentication and all, all the stuff and it will check it out. Then there still is an internal attack service also because if somebody compromises that first hop, then he will try to pivot in, as I said earlier, to the other parts of the function chain and see what he can gain or what he can get out of that. Right? So it's, as I already said, the APIs may produce the first data you see at the left-hand side, but then still there are queues, there are connections to queues, like once you have one function that will have access, maybe a connection, let's say secret in order to get to that queue. They're all interested in that, right? So it makes it a lot more complex than one simple box or one, maybe one even one environment, which you know, like, hey, that's responsible for dealing with the microservices. And that's the thing that we're focusing on. <coughs> so if we then talk about complexity, what also is pretty hard for dealing with these types of systems is monitoring and logging. You can probably imagine that if there is events driven stuff happening, um, you can imagine that the blue team maybe of, a, of an organization wants to have some internals of what's happening. So you need to correlate data. You need to monitor that data and see what's happening. Um, keep in mind that logging and correlation is important. At some point, somebody does a request. If then five function calls are being done inside your system, so you need to have some way of correlating that in order to make sure that that's the right thing that's happening, right? It makes it hard. And you can also not focus on a single point in the system. No, it's a whole chain and, and there's a lot of complexity. So most of the platforms provide logging and, and insights and so on. But still, it depends a bit on what your application is doing and how you have done the logging yourself, right? You need to make sure that the information is there and that the people that are responsible for monitoring all of it have enough insights on knowing when something is wrong or not, right? So... This makes it hard and uh, I think definitely this is one of the biggest pain points of, of doing serverless. If we then um, move on to, of course, you need to still do things in order to get functions running, right? So there's people developing software and that's, of course, something that OWASP is known for, like the development stuff and everything tied to that. So if people develop code, mistakes are being made and unfortunately that will result in vulnerabilities. I think with functions, it's even not worse, but keep in mind that you can literally use, use every technology you want, right? So I think AWS does Python, Java, .NET even, uh, JavaScript, it's all inside, right? You can just use it and the platform will make sure that the right things are being called inside your package. But every vulnerability we know from those systems will be inside function implementations. And right now, I've done some scanning of the, let's say, those examples that are available for Azure, and you will be amazed of the stuff that you will find in basic examples. People just try to show how stuff works, which makes sense, right? Because I think that helps out showing people how you need to develop stuff. But we also know, um, yeah, if then people copy paste and let's use that code, that's a bad thing. But um, especially the last one, log injections in all, I'm just going to say it in all of the Microsoft examples, they don't do anything with sanitization of the data. And I think that's a missed opportunity, as I said, because logging is important. They will just grab a request data and push it inside the log system. Okay, there might be something inside which sanitizes it, but I first think like first step, if you're developing even every type of application, if it's a web app, like input validation, step one, data enters your application domain, make sure it meets your expectations before pushing it downstream, right? And I have seen, as I said, the SQL injection was also in one of the demos and remote code execution. There are a couple of node examples. You will see it yourself if you do a GitHub search. It's pretty easy. Um, so this is definitely something that will be still around. And on top of that, right, you're developing a functions in a specific technology. There will always be third party libraries involved. Right, and uh, I think this is even maybe the biggest risk if you see functions as a service. To illustrate that, if you create as simple as your functions in C Sharp, like you take, create, take the template, tie it together, 10 lines of code, keep in mind that these are just two of the dependencies, keep in mind that there's 50,000 lines of Azure function host code behind that. 
And also keep in mind that if you're doing stuff with JSON, then within .NET, Newton software JSON is the library that's used for that, which is like the number one if you see the package manager NuGet. And that's 120k lines, right? So small app that you write yourself, but a big chunk of third party behind it. And vulnerabilities are found, right? It's just a given fact. Um, even um, I think with Newton software JSON last year, they published some stuff about um, Deserialization, which uh, mostly was focused on Java, but uh, Newton soft can also include type information, which is pretty awful if that's inside. And of course, the last one would be malicious or compromised package. Um, no JS NPM package. If you, if you go over um, the last two years, you will find two instances. I think one is ES Lint, which is this summer. It was compromised for a short time, but people were able to publish a new version with some bad code inside of it. And if it's a dependency that everybody uses and nobody pays attention, luckily there, there are people paying attention. Uh, but yeah, it can have some consequences, right? Keyloggers are inside. I think that was also a thing and, and credentials might be stolen. So small app, big, big libraries behind it. And those can be compromised and those should just be part of the risk and how you deal with it, right? So. If we then um, move again back to the diagram we saw earlier, there is a function that will access a, a queue that needs to have access to the queue based on maybe some security key or some, let's say, some type of credentials, right? Or a token that allows them to give access to that queue. It's pretty hard. You want to have those uh, secrets stored in a safe place. Not in your code, and I think Ricardo will probably talk about that one in his next talk. But you want to have it in a place which, uh, yeah, which, which which is safe, right? And what you see with most of the platforms is they will have the ability to put it inside the environment variables, and then they are available once the function executes. But there's one big downside because if one function, or at least like if the function is uh, compromised, you can read out all the environment variables and have access to those secrets. So. Both AWS and Azure have some kind of vault construction, which will have um, secrets inside and the function needs to grab it explicitly before taking action, right? So that's a, a, an additional control. Um, but in order to access the vault, you need to have a secret stored. And that's always a problem, right? You will end up having a chain of stuff. And there's a nice talk done by Ian Hacken from Netflix. He talks about uh, storing securities and how, or like storing, um, Credentials and how they do it for Netflix, which of course is like a pretty big as system. Um, and he says, like at some point, it's turtles all the way down. Like you will save it, and then you will have another problem. I think uh, if you leverage, let's say, the Azure Key Vault, you're doing a pretty good job, and you even can limit the um, access based on the function. So you can tie it to, let's say, this is the process it runs, this is the function that executes, and that function only has got access. That's secret, and that's exactly what you want. And that's also what Ian Hacken uh, concludes on how they deal, it, uh, deal with it with Netflix. So um, definitely good. I've got all the talks, or like all the things that I'm referring to, the, the links are at the back of the slide, the last slide. So we, we talked about the tech service. We talked about storing secrets. Of course, we need to also encrypt data, right? If we've got the, the architecture you saw earlier. And we need to make sure that data is encrypted when it's at rest, right? So when it's stored inside of a queue waiting for be, to be processed or maybe stored inside of a cloud database like Cosmos DB or DynamoDB. Um, most of the vendors have transparent encryption, meaning that if you push something to the queue and if it's then stored and remains there, they will take care of the encryption. And I think it's most of them. Most of them do AWS, AES uh, 265. Um, but then the first question you probably will pop up if you're dealing with security, like who is managing the keys of that? Um, you can delegate it to them, but you can luckily also, of course, have your own keys being used by them in order to store that data. But that's only data at rest, right? So if we assume that even TLS is in place, because keep in mind that if a function runs in a piece of infrastructure and it might reach out to the queue, and the second time that function in, uh, gets instantiated, it might be a completely different machine that needs to get over that that network and get to that queue. Um, we need to make sure that that connection is safe, probably TLS, but you can also consider doing encryption of your data in transit. And both AWS and Azure have got uh, a solution for that that will uh, do some key derivation and 
it will at least make sure that if the data is pushed to the queue, then the queue has the only ability to decrypt it. That was a pretty good model. So there's a lot available. Unfortunately, in this case, and that's also with the other examples, let's say like the secrets, you will have a vendor login. You will be tied to what they're doing. Um, and that's, that's just a choice at some point. But there, uh, there are a lot of similarities and what you can achieve. Um, so another aspect that you probably need to be aware of if you're developing this type of systems is the least privilege. And a function, as I already told, like maybe needs to have access to a queue and then produce output to a table storage. So it needs to read one queue and write to a specific table storage. I think it's a good idea then to only give writes to that function to perform those two actions, right? Nothing more, nothing less. Um, all the, the, the demos you see, and um, um, it's also something that Eric Peterson points out in its Qt Com talk and with AWS Lambdas. If you audit those apps, you will see a lot of uh, star uh, access roles inside those functions, meaning they have got access to everything of that system. And keep in mind that once somebody is inside and has one function and has control over what's being executed, you want to limit and you want to make sure that it's a small piece and it's not easy to get out of it, right? And hopefully monitor it and then take action. So it's also important to make sure that you review and audit it over time because if systems get complex and big, keep in mind, let's say, if you're doing development and if you've got different, let's say, development staging, production environments also as chains, there's a lot of things that need to be uh, monitored and need to be reviewed in order to do the right thing. So we talked about this and how we can then, of course, deploy uh, functions as a service. Um, I still think that um, doing this and doing this in a repetitive manner, right, so being able to reproduce the same deployment all over is important, right? So automation in that, from that perspective is king. If you're creating some pipeline that has a YAML that does all the stuff for you, and that, that's the best thing, and the deployment will be done like deployment as code, right? That's how they call it. But Keep in mind that that's also a piece of the software system that can be attacked, right? So there are a couple of examples in which CI CD systems have been attacked and somebody was able to produce output that gets deployed, right? Because it's a fully automated system, because uh, that's just the way how it works, right? You need to have gates inside of it. You need to make sure that all the, the, the requirements are met, right? So if we move into a DevOps space and everybody wants to be able to automate and uh, release quickly and test it, this is part of the deal. And I think also, let's say as a security person and also somebody who loves technology, like I need to think, or I think that the industry should be more aware of that, that it's okay to lock down systems, but it's better to facilitate development teams on doing the right thing with the new technology because this, I think serverless will be around for some time. Definitely how, how you see it, how it explodes um, one good example is Microsoft has done its Ignite conference right now. They've published a lot of new things and they're going at such a quick pace. Um, it's just inevitable, I think. So another aspect which is also important is to be aware of the, the, the separation, right? So no mixture of the dif different uh, environments. Make sure that you have the ability to automatically deploy to the different uh, development staging or production environments. So, um, wrapping up, and this is already my conclusion slide. So, I think what we see over here is um, functions. It's, it's so easy to create these types of things and to fiddle around with it and to create point of, uh, to create some concepts and deploy and show stuff that, 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 that just works. But it's really hard to keep track of all of it, right? So it's nice that there are abstractive layers on top of the whole cloud platform and a developer can just focus on the things that he needs to do. But underneath that, there's a lot more, as you already saw, that needs to be covered. And also, um, as an organization, right, keep, keep an eye on what, what's being deployed because it's all part of, of your system. Uh, I think it's important to do Threat modeling, as we saw the diagram before, make sure that you have got some idea of what the risks are in the different areas, right? You want to have compatibilization. You want to have a piece of the system that's isolated that people, if a breach happens or if something happens, then it, it can be in one spot. And monitoring and logging is, of course, <clears throat> really important in order to keep track of the anomaly compared to what's the normal behavior of the system. Um, 
And I also think it's important to have um, the automation in place and to be able to produce development packages or of the other production packages, but also configure the rights for that function, right? Everything needs to be automated um, in order to act quickly on changes, but also on, on any incidents that happen. So, yeah, so I think that wraps up <laughs> what I want to talk about. Um, any questions or no questions? <laughs> Yes. You talked about client side encryption. Uh, can you name any uh, services provided by AWS or Azure? I'm not sure what the exact name is. If you search for client side encryption in docs.microsoft.com, you will hit the article right away. And I'm not also not sure what the AWS uh, service is for it, what the name is. There's a lot of uh, cloud services that you can use. But I think it's uh, similar. If you search for the keywords, then you'll probably find it. How much faith we should keep in because everything client side is always. Not keep in mind that client side is in the context of the function, uh, okay. right? So it's still part of your own system that's being controlled, and it's mostly it has to do with the, the fact that um, in order to process data, you need to have access to it, you need to have it readable, available. But then it hits the big cloud uh, operating system, as I talked about at the beginning. And then you want to make sure that the data is protected. And we can definitely not sure rely on TLS, we all know that. So it makes sense to do something additional on top of that if the data is sensitive, right? Okay. Yes? How am I paying for this? I what? Mean, you get, you get like, if, if, if I have, if I use Amazon Lambda, I yeah. have my function in the cloud and, and then it starts running, how am I paying for this? So you need to have, you pay for your storage of the data. It's usually some kind of tier you will tie up to. And then the compute, like the milliseconds types of things. So I know for Azure, there are two models that you can use as a um, consumption model, which they will definitely just um, yeah, force you to pay for the compute that you take. And there's a, a, another like logical app model, which is like one single instance you will take and then the functions will be run inside of it, right? So that's different. So it's really based on, on the compute that you do. So a couple of milliseconds, I don't know the exact figures, but it's really small amounts. Um, I think a nice example would be um, Troy Hunt did a talk a couple of weeks ago on the .NET Conf about how Azure Functions helped him out in reducing the costs that he's having for the have you been pwned, right? Because it's a, it's a big service. It has API access. You can, uh, like a last or like one password does API checks on it to see if your password is used or not, right? Uh, that all relies on functions and I think Cloudflare caching or something like that. But it's a nice example. You should dig in there and there you can see like what the cost reduces. But keep in mind, if you're doing microservices that have a lot of compute, um, that makes still makes sense. You don't want to move that from functions because that will be unlogical to do, right? So I think if you write this kind of a system that you saw earlier, then there might be microservices functions as a service. It's, it's a, it's a whole group of things that you use in order to achieve it, I think. It's not only functions. Okay. Anything else? Nope. Okay, thanks.